Chapter Six of Graustark. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Graustark by George Barr McCutcheon. Chapter Six. Graustark. Two weeks later, Grenfell Lorry was landed and enjoying the sensations the delights of that wonderful world called by the name of Paris. The second day after his arrival he met a Harvard man of his time on the street. Harry Anguish had been a Suedo art student for two years, when at college he was a hale fellow well met, a leader in athletics and in matters upon which faculties frown. He and Laurie were warm friends, although utterly unlike in temperament. To know either of these men was to like him. Between the two one found all that was admirable and interesting in man. The faults and virtues of each were along such different lines that they balanced perfectly when lumped upon the scale of personal estimation. Their unexpected meeting in Paris was as exhilarating pleasure to both and for the next week or so they were inseparable. Together they sipped absinthe at the cafes and strolled into the theatres, the opera, the dance halls, and the homes of some of Anguish's friends, French and American. Lorry did not speak to his friend of Graustark until nearly two weeks after his arrival in the city. He had discussed with himself the advisability of revealing his plans to Anguish, fearing the latter's ridicule with all the cowardice of a man who knows that scoffing is, in a large measure, justifiable. Growing impatient to begin the search for the unheard of country, its capital, and at least one of its inhabitants, he was at last compelled to inform Anguish to a certain extent of his plans of the future. He began by telling him of his intention to take a run over toward Vienna, Budapest, and some of the eastern cities, expecting to be gone a couple of months. To his surprise and consternation, Anguish enthusiastically volunteered to take the trip with him, having had the same project in view for nearly a year. There was nothing left for Lorry but to make a clean breast of it, which he did shamefacedly, expecting the laughter and raillery of his light-hearted friend as payment for his confidence. Instead, however, Anguish, who possessed a lively and romantic nature, was charmed by the story and proclaimed it to be the most delightful adventure that had ever happened outside of a story book. Tell me all about her, he urged, his eyes sparkling with boyish enthusiasm, and Laurie proceeded to give him a personal description of the mysterious beauty, introducing him, in the same manner, to the distinguished uncle and aunt, adding all those details which had confounded and upset him during his own investigations. "'This is rich!' exclaimed Anguish. "'Beats any novel written, I declare. Begad, old man, I don't blame you for hunting down this wonderful bit of femininity. With a curiosity and an admiration that had been sharpened so keenly as yours, I'll go to the end of the world myself to have them satisfied.' I may be able to satisfy but one curiosity, and maybe not that, but who knows of Graustark? Don't give up before you've tried. If these people live in such a place, why, it is to be found, of course. Any railroad guide-book can locate this land of mystery. There are so many infernal little kingdoms and principalities over here, that it would take a lifetime to get them all straightened out in one's head. Tomorrow morning we'll go to one of the big railway stations and make inquiries. We'll locate Graustark, 
and then we'll go over and pluck the flowers that grow there. All you need, my boy, is a manager. I'll do the arranging, and your little act will be the plucking. Easier said than done. She threw a kiss to you, didn't she? Certainly, but confound it. That was because she never expected to see me again. Same reason why you threw a kiss to her, I suppose. I know why. I wasn't accountable. Well, if she did it any more wittingly than you did, she is accountable, and I'd hunt her down and demand an explanation. Lorry laughed at his apparent fervour, but was glad that he had confided in his energetic countrymen. Two heads were better than one, and he was forced to admit to himself that he rather liked the idea of company in the undertaking. Not that he expected to encounter any particular difficulty, but that he saw a strange loneliness ahead. Therefore he welcomed his friend's avowed intention to accompany him to Idlewise as a relief instead of an annoyance. Until late in the night they discussed the coming trip, Anguish finally startling him with the question, just as he was stretching himself preparatory to the walk to his hotel. "'What are you going to do with her after you find her, Gren, old man?' Grenfell's brow puckered, and he brought himself up with a jerk, puzzled uncertainty expressing itself in his posture as well as in his face. "'I'll think about that after I have found her,' he replied. "'Think you'll marry her?' persisted the other. "'How do I know?' exclaimed the woman-hunter savagely. "'Oh, of course you don't know. How could you?' apologised Anguish. "'Maybe she won't have you. Maybe she is married. All sorts of contingencies, you know. But if you'll pardon my inquisitiveness, I'd like to ask why you are making this wild goose chase half around the world, just to have another look at her. You asked me if I thought here he stopped. I take it for granted, then, that you'll like to— Well, I'm glad that I've got something definite on which to base operations. The one object of our endeavours from now on is to exchange Guggenslocker for lorry. Certainly no robbery. A charity, I should say. Good night. See you in the morning. The next morning the two friends took a cab to several railway stations, and inquired about Graustark and Idlewise. "'She was stringing you, old man,' said Anguish, after they had turned away from the third station. He spoke commiseratingly, as he really felt sorry. "'No,' exclaimed Lorry. "'She told me the truth. "'There is a Graustark, and she lives there. "'I'll stake my life on those eyes of hers.' "'Are you sure she said it was in Europe?' asked Harry, looking up and down the street, as if he would not have been surprised to see her in Paris. In his heart he believed that she and her precious relatives had deceived old Green. Perhaps their home was in Paris, and nowhere else. But for Lorry's positiveness he would have laughed heartily at the other's simple credulity or branded him a dolt, the victim of some merry actress's whim. Still, he was forced to admit he was not in a position to see matters as they appeared, and was charitable enough to bide his time, and to humour the faith that was leading them from place to place, in effort to find a land that they knew nothing about. Lorry seemed so sure, so positive, that he was loath to see his dream dispelled, his ideal shattered. There was certainty no Graustark, neither had the Guggenslockers, sailed on the Willem, all apparent evidence to the contrary, notwithstanding. Lorry had been in a delirium, and had imagined he saw her on the ship. If there, why was not her name in the list? 
but the problem tortured the sanguine searcher himself. At last, in despair, after a fruitless search for two days, Lorry was willing to submit, with the perseverance common to half-defeated fighters. Anguish at once protested, forgetting that he had sought to dissuade his friend the day before. "'We'll go to the Library of Paris, and take a look through the books and maps,' he said. "'Or better still, let us go to the post office. There. Why have we not thought of that? What there is of Graustark they'll know in the postal service.' Together they visited the chief post office, where, after being directed to various deputies and clerks, they at length found the department in which the information was obtainable. Inside of five minutes they were in possession of facts that vindicated Miss Guggenslocker, lifted Lorry to the seventh heaven, and put Mr. Anguish into an agony of impatience. Graustark was a small principality away off to the east, and Idlewise was a city of some seventy-five thousand inhabitants, according to the postal guidebook. The Americans could learn no more there, so they went to Baydecker's office. Here they found a great map, and, after a diligent and almost microscopic search, succeeded in discovering the principality of Graustark. Then they looked at each other in dismay. "'It's a devil of a distance to that little red blot on the map,' mused Lorry, pulling his nose reflectively. "'What an outlandish place for a girl like her to live,' he continued. "'And that sweet-faced old lady and noble Uncle Caspar. "'Yeah, gods! One would think barbarians existed there, "'and not such people as the Guggenslockers.' refined, cultivated, smart, rich. I'm more interested than ever in the place. So am I. I'm willing and ready to make the trip, old man, if you are still of a mind. It's a lark. And besides, she may not be the only pretty and gracious girl there. We've had bad work to find it on the map. Let's not stop till we see Idlewise on the earth itself. They made hasty preparations for the journey. Anguish, romantic and full of adventure, advised the purchase of a pair of pistols and a knife apiece, maintaining that, as they were going into a, an unknown and mountainous region, they should be prepared for brigands and other elements of danger. Lorry pooh-poohed the suggestion of brigands, but indulged his mood by buying some ugly-looking revolvers and inviting the prospect of something really thrilling in the way of an adventure. With their traps, they were soon whirling through France, bound for a certain great city on the road to Idlewise, one filled with excitement, eagerness and boyish zeal, the other harassed by the sombre fear that a grave disappointment was in store for him. Through the glamour and the picturesqueness of the adventure, there always crept the unconquerable feeling that he was on a fool's errand, and he was committing a deed so weak and brainless that it was sure to make him a veritable laughing stock when it became known. After all, who was Miss Guggenslocker, brewer, baker, gardener or sausage-maker. Travelling, of course, was pleasant at this time of the year, and the two Americans saw much that interested them along the way. Their French, especially anguishes, was of great value to them, for they found occasion to use it at all times and in all places. Both spoke German fairly well, and took every opportunity to brush up in that language, Lorry remembering that the Guggenslockers used many expressions that showed a preference for the Teutonic. The blithe anguish, confident and in high feather, was heart and soul in the odd expedition of love, and talked incessantly of their reception by the faraway hostess, 
their impressions and the final result. His camera and sketching materials were packed away with his traps. It was his avowed attention to immortalize the trip by means of plate, palette, and brush. At the end of two days they reached a certain large city, the first change, and then seven hundred miles to another. The distance from this point to the capital of Graustark was two hundred miles or more, chiefly through mountainous lands. Somewhat elated by the cheerful information they received, they resumed the journey to Idlewise, the city of Vale, Slope and Park, summer, fall and winter. Changing cars at the end of the second day out, they sat back in the dusty seats of their carriage, and sighed with relief. Unless we jump the track, this train will land us in the city we are looking for, said Anguish, stretching out his legs comfortably. I'll admit it has been a tiresome journey, and I'll be glad when we can step into a decent hotel, have a rub, and feel like white men once more. I am beginning to feel like these dirty slabs and huns we saw way back there. There's one thing certain, said Lorry, looking out of the window. The people and the habitations are different, and the whole world seems changed since we left that station. Look at those fellows on horseback over there. What did I tell you about brigands and robbers? exclaimed Anguish. If those fellows are not bandits, I'll lose faith in every novel I ever read. The train rolled slowly past three mounted men, whose steeds stood like statues upon a little knoll to the right of the track, men and beasts engaged in silent contemplation of the cars. The men, picturesquely attired and looking fierce, carrying long rifles, certainly bore an aspect that suggested the brigand. When the guard entered the carriage, Anguish asked in German for some information concerning the riders. "'Der Frontier Police Guards,' responded the man in English, smiling at their astonishment. Both Americans arose and shook hands with him. "'By George, it's good to hear a man talk white man's language,' cried Anguish. How do you come to be holding a job on this road? An Englishman? demanded Lorry. He looked anything but English. I'm not an Englishman, said the guard, flushing slightly. My name's Sinsky, and I'm an American, sir. An American? exclaimed Lorry. Sinsky grew loquacious. Sure, I used to be a sailor on a United States man o' war. A couple of years ago I got into trouble down at Constantinople, and had to get out of the service. After that I drifted up this way, and went to railroading. He hadn't exactly the manner of a man of warsman. "'How long have you been on this road?' asked Grenfell. "'About a year, I should think. Been on this branch only two months, though. Are you pretty well acquainted in Idlewise?' "'Oh!' I run in there every other day, in and out again. It's a fine place, purtiest you ever saw in your life. The town's runs right up in the mountain to the tip-top, where the monks are clear up in the clouds. They say it snows up there almost all the time. Later on, from the loquacious guard, the two Americans learned quite a good bit about the country and city to which they were going. His knowledge was somewhat limited along certain lines, but quite clear as to others. This Graustark, for as I know, is either a sort of state or something belonging to the umpire, governed by its own rulers. Idlewise is the capital. The big guns of the land lives there. I've walked out and saw the castle where the princess and the royalty hangs out. The people speak a language of their own, and I can't get next to a tink, they say. But once in a while you find some guy that talks French or German. They've got a little standing army of two, three thousand men, and they've got 
they're hottest uniforms you ever did see, red and black and gold. I don't see why the United Rates can't get up something foxy for her soldiers to wear. Had a war over here not long ago, I understand, something like ten or fifteen years ago. There's another little country up north of Graustark, and they got in a wrangle about something, and they tell me in Idlewise that for about a year they fought like Sam Patch. Which was victorious? demanded Lorry, deeply interested. I'm not sure. To hear the Idlewise people talk, you'd think they licked the daylights out of the other slobs, but somehow I got next to the fact that them other fellows captured the city and went after a slashing big war indemnity. I don't know much about it, and maybe I'm clear off, but I think de Graustark army was trashed. Everything is prosperous now, though, and you'd never know there'd been a war. It's the most peaceable town I ever saw. Did you ever hear of the Guggenslockers? asked the impressible Anguish and Lorry felt like kicking him. In Idlewise? Never did. Friends of yours? Acquaintances, interposed Lorry hastily, frowning at anguish. You won't have any trouble finding em, if they're anybody at all, said Sinsky easily. De hotel people ought to be able to tell you all about em. By the way, what is the best hotel there? asked anguish. There's the Bernawentz, one block north of the depot. The travellers looked at one another and smiled. Sinsky, observing the action, oh, he said pleasantly, there's a swell joint uptown called the Regentgens. It's too steep for me, but maybe you gents can stand it. If you'll hang round the depot for a little while after we get in, I'll steer you up there. We'll make it worth your while, Sinsky said Lorry. Never mind that now. Americans ought to stick together, no matter where they are. We'll have a drink, and that's all, just to show we're fellow countrymen. We'll have several drinks, and we'll eat and drink tonight at the swell joint you talk about, said Anguish. We may drink there, but I'll not eat there. They wouldn't let railroad guard inside the feeding pen, why, nothing but royal guys eat there when they're downtown shopping or exposing themselves in public gaze. True to his word, when they reached Idlewise late that afternoon, Sinsky, their friend of uncertain origin, hurriedly finished his work and joined the travellers in the station. Lorry and Anguish were deeply interested in all they saw. The strange people, the queer buildings, the odd costumes and the air of antiquity that prevailed. Once upon the narrow, clean street, they saw that Idlewise was truly a city of the mountain side. They had expected something wonderful, but were not prepared for what they found. The city actually ran up into the clouds. There was something so grand, so improbable, so unusual, in the spectacle confronting them, that they stared like children, aghast and stupefied. Each had the startling impression that a great human dotted mountain was falling over upon his head. It was impossible to subdue the sensation of dizziness that the toppling town inspired. "'I know how you feel,' observed Sinsky, laughing. "'I was just the same at first. Tomorrow you walk a little ways up the side of the mountain, and you'll see how much of the city there is on level ground down here. Them buildings up there ain't more one-fiftieth part of the town. There's mostly summer houses. It gets hot as blazes down here in the valley in the middle of the summer, and the rich ones move up the mountain. How in thunder do people get up to those houses? demanded anguish. Mules, answered Sitsky, specifically. Say, see that little old fellow coming on horseback with the white uniform? Well, that's the chief of police, 
and the fellows behind him are police guards. At's old Dangloss himself. He's a peach, they say. A short, grizzly-faced man, attired in a white uniform with red trimmings, followed by three men similarly garbed, rode by, going in the direction of the passenger station. Dangloss, as Sinsky had called him, was quite small in stature, rather stout, grey-bearded and eagle-nosed. His face was keen and red, and not at all the kind to invite familiarity. As he passed them, the railroad guard of American citizenship touched his cap, and the two travellers bowed, whereupon the chief of police gave them a most profound salutation, fairly sweeping his saddle skirts with his white cap. Polite old codger, observed anguished. His company manners. Just let him get you in the sweat-box if you think he's polite. Ever been there? Well, a little confusedly, I pasted a Graustark baggage smasher down in the yards two weeks ago, and they had me up. I proved a fella insulted a lady, and old Dangloss let me off, saying I'd ought to have a medal. These guys are great on gallantry when ladies is concerned. If it hadn't been for dad, I'd be in the lock-up now, and say, you ought to see the lock-up. It's a tower, with dungeons, and all that sort of thing. A man could no more get out, and he could fly up to the monastery. Dear great on law and order here too. The princess has issued strictest kind of rules, and everybody has to live up to em like as if they was real gospel. I thought I'd put you next, gents, so's you wouldn't do anything crooked here. Thanks, said Lorry dryly. We shall try to conduct ourselves discreetly in the city. Probably a quarter mile farther down the narrow, level street, they came to the bazaars, the gaudy stores, and then the hotel. It was truly a hostelry to inspire respect and admiration in the mind of such as Sinsky, for it was huge and well equipped with modern appointments. As soon as the two Americans had been given their rooms, they sent for their luggage. Then they went out to the broad piazza, with its columns and marble balustrades, and looking for Sinsky, remembering their invitation to drink, the guard had refused to enter the hotel with them, urging them to allow him to remain on the piazza. He was not there when they returned, but they soon saw him. On the sidewalk he was arguing with a white-uniformed police guard, and they realized that he had been ejected from sacred precincts. They promptly rescued him from the officer who bowed and strode away as soon as they interceded. "'Those fellows is slick enough to see you are swells, and I'm not,' said Sinsky, not a bit annoyed by his encounter. "'I'll bet my head at inside ten minutes old Dangloss will know who you are, where you come from, and what you're doing here. "'I'll bet fifty heads he won't find out what we're doing here,' grinned Anguish, looking at Lorry. Well, let's hunt up the first department. They found the little apartment in which drinks were served at tables, and before they said good-bye to Sinsky, in front of the hotel, a half an hour later, that worthy was in seeding good humour and very much flushed in the face. He said he would be back in two days, and if they needed him for any purpose whatever, they could reach him by a note at the railway station. Funny how you run across an American in every nook and corner of the world, mused Lorry, as they watched the stocky ex-man O'Warsman stroll off towards his hotel. If we can run across the Guggenslockers as easily, we'll be in luck. When shall we begin the hunt? Tonight? We can make a few inquiries concerning them. They certainly are people of importance here. I don't see the name on any of the brewery signs around town, observed Anguish consolingly. 
There's evidently no Guggenslocker here. They strolled through the streets near the hotel until after six o'clock, wondering at the quaint architecture, the pretty gardens, and the pastoral atmosphere that enveloped the city. Everybody was busy, contented, quiet, and happy. There was no bustle or strife, no rush, no beggars. At six they saw hundreds of working men on the streets, going to their homes, shops were closed, and there came to their ears the distant boom of cannon, evidently fired from different points of the compass, and from the highland as well as the lowland. The toy army is shooting off the good-night guns, speculated Anguish. I suppose everybody goes to bed now. Or to dinner, substituted Lorry, and they returned to the Regent Gets. The dining hall was spacious and beautiful, a mixture of Oriental and the medieval. It rapidly filled. Who the dickens can all these people be? They look well, Anguish whispered as if he feared their nearest neighbours might understand his English. They are unquestionably of the class in which we must expect to find the Guggenslockers. Before the meal was over, the two strangers saw that they were attracting a great deal of attention from the other guests of the house. The women, as well as the men, were eyeing them and commenting quite freely it was easy to see. These two handsome, smooth-faced young Americans were as men from another world, so utterly unlike their companions were they in personal appearance. They were taller, broader, and more powerfully built than the swarthy-faced men about them, and it was no wonder that the women allowed admiration to show in their eyes. Toward the end of the dinner, several officers came in, and the Americans took particular pains to study them. They were cleanly built fellows, about medium height, wiry and active. As a class, the men appeared to average five feet seven inches in height, some a little taller, some a little shorter. The two strangers were over six feet tall, broad-shouldered and athletic. They looked like giants among these Graustark men. They're not very big, but they look as if they'd be nasty in a scrap, observed Anguish, unconsciously throwing out his chest. Strong as wildcats, I'll wager. The women are perfect, though. Have you ever seen a smarter set of women, Harry? Never, never a paradise of pretty women. I believe I'll take out naturalization papers. When the two strangers left the dining room, they were conscious that every eye in the place was upon them. They drew themselves to their full height and strode between the tables toward the door, feeling that as they were on exhibition, they ought to appear to the best advantage. During the evening they heard frequent allusions to the Americans, but could not understand what was said. The hotel men were more than obsequious. The military men and citizens were exceedingly differential. The women who strolled on the piazza or in the great garden back of the hotel were discreetly curious. We seem to be the whole show here, Gren, said Anguish as they sat down at one of the tables in the garden. I guess Americans are rare. I've found one fellow who can speak German and French, and not one except our guard who can talk English. That clerk talks German fairly well. I never heard such a language as these other people use. Say, old man, we'd better make inquiry about our friends tonight. That clerk probably won't be on duty tomorrow. We'll ask him before we go to bed, agreed Lorry, and upon leaving the brilliantly lighted garden, they sought the landlord and asked if he could tell them where Caspar Guggenslocker lived. He looked politely incredulous and thoughtful, 
and then, with profound regret, assured them that he had never heard the name. He said he had lived in Idlewise all his life, and knew everybody of consequence in the town. "'Surely there must be such people here,' cried Lorry, almost appealingly. He felt disheartened and cheated. Anguish was biting his lips. "'Oh, possibly among the poorer classes. "'If I were you, sir, I should call on Captain Dangloss, the chief of police. "'He knows every soul in Idlewise. "'I am positive I have never heard the name. "'You will find the captain at the tower tomorrow morning.' "'The two Americans went to bed, "'one so dismayed by his disappointment "'that he could not sleep for hours.' End of chapter 6